astronaut, 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 astronaut. <laughs> Somebody would have thought that when a story requires you to mention the fucking word 20 times that you would know of it. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're in the presence of greatness. Hi, everybody. You look lost, but I think we just found you. Which words can you not pronounce? <laughs> you would have thought I spent the whole morning researching a story of an astronaut, space woman, and still can't pronounce the word for shit. It's a wild ride today. It's a wild story. It's yet another gone bad. Just a quick disclaimer, because this story doesn't get as brutal as a lot of ones that I cover. So I don't want somebody to, you know, stay until the end of the video and then be like, oh, Maya, this is actually disappointing. Don't be like that. Don't, don't call my stories disappointing. This is a wild story and I really need your help. That's why I'm telling you the story, because I have a lot more questions after having finished this research than answers. So I really need your help to, to crack this case, especially on the front of the motive, or just in general, am I missing a piece when it comes to Lisa Nova going bad? Speaking of going bad, this is Gone Bad. It's a series that comes out on Wednesdays on this channel. And it channels ordinary people like you and me that are doing, you know, just solid boring jobs, doing the grind 9 to 5, and then they decide to switch up. They just... something snaps in them and they turn to crime. So let's get into it. Just another quick one before we start. This story loosely inspired the movie Lucy in the Sky, the Natalie Portman, John Hamm one, although both Natalie Portman and John Hamm, especially John Hamm, are hotter in the movie than the real life people. And of course, there's like a lot of dynamics and dilemmas about like the, using the word loosely because it's not exactly based on the story and a lot of things are inaccurate, but just, you know, if something rings a bell when you hear about this, it's probably because you might have watched that movie. And if you did watch it, tell me if it's worth watching after listening to this story. Cool, now that I got that out of my system, let's dive in. Today I'm bringing you the story of the astronaut Lisa Novak. Plenty of us, that is, everybody that is not following NASA news or news of people going into space, only learned about Lisa in February 2007. And that is because she actually traveled 900 miles. It's speculated it's about 950 miles. So, a lot of time. At the age of 43, all the way from Houston to Orlando Airport. And she wasn't traveling unequipped. She had a mallet, she had a BB gun, a knife and a pepper spray on her. A lot of speculation and contention is going to come to trial about this next thing, but I kind of believe that it was probably true. And that is that Lisa actually drove her car wearing diapers in order not to stop for 900 plus miles and to make this ride speedier. Where was she rushing to? Well, she was headed to the arrival section to wait for a woman. Was it her friend? Was it her mother? Was it her sister? Somebody she loved dearly. No, why would she be carrying a mullet and like a pepper spray and a knife? That wouldn't lead to a welcoming arrival. No, she was waiting for her ex boyfriends, flings. She would say he was a boyfriend, he would say it was casual. New girlfriend. If you're anything like me, your first question is, is this a case of stalking? And in short, yes, to a certain degree. Prior to this crime, this was classic case of stalking, because how Lisa obtained the information about this person's flight is that she used the key that her ex-boyfriend gave her to his flat and then just never took it back once they broke up to break into the flat and just go through their stuff, read through their emails, so she got the exact information of the flight details. So Lisa knew Colleen Shipman, the woman she is waiting for, is to get out around 1 a.m. Which, yes, you might be wondering, this case is actually insane, like she's at the airport at 1 a.m. having driven the whole night. And yes, it gets even worse, because now people are coming, you know how they're coming like from the arrivals, and some of them are complaining, you know, like, yeah, there's plenty of them waiting for, like, delayed luggage. 
so she's like cool 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 another thing lisa is wearing like a completely probably conspicuous trench coat that makes her look like a lunatic and a wig on top of her in order for this woman not to recognize her Eventually, she sees Colleen stepping out with her suitcase and going to one of those shuttle buses that is to transport her from the terminal to the parking for her to get into her car and go on with her life. So Lisa creepily follows her onto this bus, goes in, tries to stay down for Colleen again not to be alerted. After Colleen gets off this shuttle bus, she just starts moving to her car, but now she realizes that creepy woman from the bus is following her. So she's trying to speed up while Lisa is following her and she's just asking her like, can I please borrow your phone to call my boyfriend like he was supposed to pick me up from the airport? And Colleen is just trying to be like, no, sorry, my battery is dead. Just trying to be smart, late smart and get to her car as fast as possible. Then Lisa is still persisting and following her to her car, asking her can she give her a ride to the parking office, trying to get into her car. By this point, Colleen made it to the car and she just literally walked in and shut the door and she's probably freaking out. And Lisa is there at her window, sobbing, crying, breaking down and asking Colleen if she could just open the window because she can't hear her responses any longer. To which Colleen kind of just cracks it open, but she does crack it open enough for Lisa to pepper spray her. But this is when Colleen goes into survival mode and she just backs that car away from the parking spot and just drives away. Because Colleen's phone wasn't dead, as you already knew, she managed to call the police and Orlando police immediately came to the airport and they noticed Lisa, like she didn't take the wig off and that weird trench coat and they also noticed her like dropping a bag into trash so they arrested her for attempted kidnapping and burglary and they took that bag as evidence. While at the scene they immediately searched her car and Lisa's car just spoke for itself. In the car they found hundreds of dollars in cash, printouts of different personal emails between her ex Offline and Colleen Shipman, pepper spray, a knife, gloves, a BB gun, a mallet and a disc drive with images of bondage scenes. They will also find diapers in the car, but later her own attorney in the trial are going to claim that those diapers are like her children's ones and they used them during the hurricane season two years ago, so that's why, you know, those diapers were just in the car. It becomes important, unfortunately, when you're speaking about the mental state of somebody that drove for 900 miles to get to the airport and, you know, when you speak about premeditation. It's weird. And also what fascinated me when researching this case is that I didn't know but it makes complete sense like astronauts do use diapers in space like on the regular because when they're in their suits and you know they're doing space missions it's not like they can just go to the toilet plus they're like literally floating in space. Which kind of goes against her because again she knew what she needed to do and she knew exactly how long this drive is how long she could go without peeing, what she could use to avoid stopping for breaks and reach that airport at the correct time. While in police custody, Lisa wanted to speak with Colleen to like sort of clarify this was just a misunderstanding, but the police kind of was obviously protecting this from happening and they were questioning Colleen like, do you know this woman? Her name is Lisa Novak. And Colleen was there like, you know what? I remember one time my husband did call me her name in bed accidentally. That, that must have been a bit awkward. <laughs> so let me just give him a quick call just to clarify was that his like deranged ex. So she did and they realized oh it's your deranged ex that has been stalking us for quite some time and actually tried to just probably kill me. While this is happening, NASA obviously had to react and to release an official statement. And NASA said because she's working as the naval officer rather than a civil servant, so the way I interpret that is kind of like she was more of a freelance rather than working full time, they don't have to take any administrative action. They clean their hands. They're like, mm -hmm, this is messy. We don't want nothing to do with it. 
Before I tell you what happens when Lisa goes to trial and what this has brought to her, let's talk a bit about how did we get here. What in her childhood, in her career, what in the days preceding this has really led to this escalation? At the time of this incident, Lisa was a US Navy captain and she started working for NASA in 1996. Well, she was born on May 10, 1963, as Lisa Caputo. She was born in Washington to a computer consultant and a biological specialist. When she was only five in 1969, she watched the Apollo moon landing on television and she became really immersed and excited. And like so many children, she would look at TV and be like, this is something I want to do one day. But when she was that young, she didn't know whether it was possible. That's because she was a female. So she was kind of keeping tabs on it constantly, the newspapers, libraries, TV. And she realized in 1978, women could actually go and join the space program. And that's when she decided to commit to this and study at university. So she studied bachelor's at aerospace engineering and then committed to master's in aeronautical engineering. And it was hard, which makes this story so much more interesting for me, because when you look at it and what she lost, like the years and years of hard work just in one snap of events, it just makes this story so much more crazy. Because at uni, she was part of only 6% of females that studied that subject, that they were accepted to study it, should I say. And after it, when she joined the Naval Air Station, women weren't allowed to do combat training. So regardless of how talented and how able she was, she still wasn't able to do half of the jobs that men were. Which means the fact that she was doing well brought her so much more hate, not just from other females, but especially from men once she would overtake or once she actually managed to get herself into flight training, which was technically unachievable for women at that time. But Lisa was ambitious and she completed primary flight training and qualified to become a naval flight officer in 1987. And Lisa would just take any opportunity on her way as naval flying officer. She was working on acquisitions of new systems, trying to always develop the aircrafts that were to go into space. Also, during her career, she logged over 1,500 hours in over 30 different aircrafts. She was awarded multiple different medals, like Navy Commendation Medal and Navy Achievement Medal. And as if that wasn't enough, she was balancing her job with the family. Because at the Naval Academy, she met this guy called Richard. Soon enough, the two of them ended up married and having three children. And she took a lot of pride in being able to balance her career and her family life. And in one interview, she said, it is a challenge, but she's happy to let us know that she learned how to do it. In 1996, a few things happen where I think it might have established the course of her life in the future, and there might have already been the point of no return. Let me know what you think about that. The first thing that happened is that there was an opportunity for Lisa to actually fly into space, which was obviously something that she dreamed of since she was five years of age. NASA received around 2,400 applications and they were only accepting 150 people and Lisa made it to the list. And then out of those 150, they had to cut it. So there were only 10 pilots and 25 mission specialists in the end that were to go into space. Lisa was obviously one of the mission specialists. So they ring Lisa and they're like, hey, can you report to Johnson Space Center with the rest of 34 people? one of which was William Offerline. If that name doesn't mean much to you now, just wait. At this point, her husband is still working for the Navy as well as Naval Flight Officer, but they moved location. They moved to Texas, obviously for like a bigger house, planning an even bigger family, because at this point, I think she only had one child and then later she would have twins that she would be balancing with all of this madness. And at this point, people describe her just as like, what you would think of as an American mom, like, you know, what basically all of the failed sitcoms have been based on. Branches with a girlfriend's barbecue like in the weekend, hobbies, being a soccer mom, according to a random article, collecting rubber stamps and growing African violets also went into that. 
Let me just go quickly Google what African violets. Slight disappointment, African violets did not impress me just now. Between this year and 2001, she is having twins and balancing this life on and off with her husband because he also works at the Navy, but she is working to develop this cool robotic arm. So this was called Space Shuttle's robotic arm or Canada arm. And again, I'm gonna try to simplify this the way I understand it, but it's supposed to be this arm that can scan the space shuttle and notice if anything is wrong with it, notice if it's the correct temperature, if it's the correct size, like if anything has changed before actually setting it off. I'm eagerly waiting to get corrected on that one because that's my simplification of it. It might be a completely different thing. I mean, regardless of what this arm did, she made the whole ass robotic arm with the help of other. Still, regardless, one of the coolest things that I have ever covered in the story, even if it was just a robotic freaking arm. The next couple of years are going to bring some serious triggers in her life, however. The first one comes in 2003, in February, when she lost one of her closest friends at the Navy. So there was this shuttle that was returning from space and something hit its wing and it broke off. So during that trip, seven astronauts lost their lives, including Lisa's friend, Laurel Clark. And Clark's husband, now widower, actually said that Lisa took it so hard and she found it so stressful that in the months after this event she kind of completely distanced herself from her own family in order to support Clark's, to support theirs. So she took over everything from like finances, admin stuff, making sure like her funeral is taken care of and making sure that Laurel's son is taken care of and by doing so neglecting her family completely. And Jonathan, the widower, actually said, like, she just found this so stressful and she was, again, trying to be on top of everything while incapable to, like, process grief and to actually be on top of, like, 100 things that she just put on her own plate. But in January 2004, there was another interesting event to kind of take her mind off this grief that she is now still processing and dealing with. And this was with her buddies from the Navy, and it was called Survival Course. So they were all to be dropped in the middle of nowhere in Quebec, and to then find their own way. In January, in snow, in the middle of nowhere, 2004, still, there's no like Google Maps or Apple Maps. So they completed this on foot, obviously, and they walked for around 20 kilometers, and have completed this course in 11 days. But during this course, remember Opheline? Well, he was present and of course, they're just walking for 11 freaking days in the wilderness. There was some chemistry between the two. So when the two of them returned to Texas, to Houston, they became an affair. And they had to conceal it because actually under law, they would have both been fired and actually charged for adultery had anybody at the Navy found out, and they both worked for the same workplace. But Offerline's wife found out, this is gonna sound like deja vu, but she found out by discovering the emails between Lisa and William Offerline, so she divorced him in 2005. And this is when Offerline moves into that small apartment, he gives Lisa a key, but he is pretending this is all casual. Don't do that, guys. We've all known about Joe D'Arias' case by now. Just, just state it immediately. I am not emotionally ready. I have been married until, like, yesterday. Don't give them any false hope or give them key to their house, because that's definitely a false hope. You might have as well bought a toothbrush for them for the house. So, of course, Lisa goes completely normal and not psychotic here and moves technically most of her stuff in and becomes very familiar with all of the residents and the neighbors because what a better way to keep an eye on your lover. Around this time, she's still having that affair. Her own marriage obviously isn't going really well because she's completely infatuated by Offerline. And in 2007, she knew that there was a space mission upcoming. She actually had the opportunity to go to space. 
and she did which she probably knew this was her one and only chance, like this is gonna happen only once, so she just cherished it even more because this is what she has been working on ever since she was five years old. So in July 2006, she was aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery as a mission flight engineer and she spent nearly two weeks in space. After this mission, her husband kind of filed for divorce, like he just knew that this isn't going anywhere, she's clearly having this affair, and just her priorities are completely different than they were when they married. She finalizes her divorce, but then Offline comes through in mid-January 2007, which if you remember is very particular that this was probably the final trigger in all of this because the incident, the attack, happened in February 2007, so less than a month after this. Offline actually said, ah, you know what, you know how I have that pattern from the past? Well, I'm actually seeing somebody else. Yeah, she actually works for the Navy as well. Mm -hmm. Her name is Colleen Shipman. Yeah. You know, the, the Air Force Captain Colleen Shipman, that one. I think you should be very understanding towards this, like probably disappointed, but you will be understanding, right? No, Offaline, she will not. She will use the key that you gave her, making her believe that she is in a serious relationship with you, and she will go into your flat. By the end of January, as if all of these triggers weren't enough, she also wasn't given another mission that she thought she was going to get. It was given to a male. So again, it was about going to a space as a mission specialist, which she has done before now, but it was given to another captain, and she was given some other smaller job instead. When you and me are seeing this, we see some obvious triggers that have been missed by probably multiple people, but her workplace was one of them. NASA didn't do any follow-ups when it comes to mental health testing in the past, so she had like a psychological assessment in 1996 and then had no follow-ups for 11 years. And obviously, because she was a female, she was fighting for all of this, she couldn't complain. She couldn't go to somebody and say, actually, you know, <laughs> I've been having a lot on my plate, you know, multiple kids, an affair, this guy, obviously she couldn't confess to the affair because that would get her actually legally charged. You know, I'm getting through a divorce, I kind of really need help. Or you have given this job to somebody who isn't as deserving as I am because then, well, she would never have another chance to go into space. Because for even this one instance for her to go to space, she had to work for years to get it, to achieve it. So even though she was probably going through an emotional turmoil at this point, she couldn't go to anybody to complain or to just seek help because she knew there was another person lined up and she is just going to lose her space in the program. So these were the events that preceded February the 5th at 1 a.m when Lisa attacked Colleen. So it was only a week after she wasn't given the mission that she wanted, less than a month after her lover ditched her for another woman, and, well, a couple of months after she actually got divorced. What came in the aftermath of this event? And then something I really need you to fill out the comment section with, and that is, what do you think motivated Lisa? Lisa's trial. <laughs> Lisa's trial. Maybe I just love drama, but I wish it was televised. <laughs> so her lawyers, of course, argued this was definitely not a kidnapping attempt. Actually, she pled not guilty by the reason of insanity. They said she had different personality disorders, like OCD, she suffered from insomnia and depression, and she was just attempting to speak to the person that was in the vehicle. What is not clear, the fact that she just knew the person and was armed with a pepper spray and different arms? No, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. This is how she communicates, she pepper sprays in the face when you open up a window. So her lawyer actually used that argument to say that she should be released on bail because she is no flight risk. And uh, the judge actually, because of her career and because this is her first offense, agreed. 
Another thing that came to light during this trial, because some of these trial notes are all over the place, that was that Offerline actually had a phone that he had given Lisa to still sort of stay in touch with her. Again, just don't. Just stop whatever you're doing. So, it was unclear who gave calls to whom, but there were plenty of calls recorded in December and January. And if you remember, well, they kind of broke it off in January. Also, I'm not sure what they mean, but it's unclear. There were over 100 calls. Because this can work to support the prosecution to say that she is a stalker because she has called him over 100 times in a span of a month. But then it can also work towards a different story of why is he still communicating with her. It also came to light that Lisa and Offerlein still had lunch that January, like after a breakup, and they still trained together, like went to gym, went to, to cycle together to train for like races. Despite all of that, despite Colleen literally begging this judge and saying this is attempted murder, Lisa was let out on bail, just given the ankle bracelet, and even that ankle bracelet was removed within a month. Prior to her actual trial, a couple of things happened. It was made public that she is going to plea the insanity, so the judge ordered two psychiatrists to test her out and see if they can diagnose her. And they diagnosed her with OCD, with Asperger's syndrome, with a single episode of major depressive disorder, and a brief psychotic disorder with marked stressors at the time of the incident. It sounds like a diagnosis for every person that has ever been on an episode of SNAP. They remember every single other event from their life, but this? They just switched on and then switched on right after it. Yeah, once they disposed of the bag. And once they were arrested with like the wig and the trench coat. Finally, she decided to enter a guilty plea for felony burglary and misdemeanor battery. And the judge just looked at it and he was like, you know, she is a first time offender, she had this brilliant career, let's make her sentence as light as humanly possible. So Lisa got only a year of probation, community service, and she was ordered to write a letter of apology to Colleen. Guess who was unhappy with this decision? Colleen. Because she still to this day believes that Lisa would have killed her. If she wasn't as careful, if she let her in the car, if she didn't make it to the car, if she opened the window a bit further, she was petrified and after the event she was paranoid, she had to have arms on her, she had to constantly be on the lookout. Of course, this verdict came with a restraining order, so she couldn't go anywhere near Offerline or Colleen. So, both parties just moved on with their lives. The latest update came from 2017, and it said that Lisa is living still in Texas, but she's just living a quiet life and working in the private sector. As for Offerline and Colleen Shipman, they have actually gotten married in 2010, they have a child, and they are running this website called Adventure Write, and it's kind of like writing competitions for children. I actually opened it up, it's pretty solid, pretty cool. And the two of them moved to Alaska and distanced themselves from any news on Lisa, which I don't blame them truly. Seems like the best of both worlds in this situation. And when People magazine asked Colleen in 2016 did she forgive Lisa Nowak, well, Colleen said she committed a crime, she was convicted, she finished her sentence, I'm not sure there's anything really for me to forgive. So what, what a beautiful ending to the story. Oh, also, NASA did something, yeah, yeah, the, the, the space, the astronaut place, yeah, they introduced annual psychological screenings. For everybody. Round of applause, round of applause. I still cannot believe that this is happening after 2007. Like, I still, I don't know why it will never stop fascinating me that mental health is just still not taken seriously to this day. So, hey, they introduced a program 
So you could say maybe Lisa did something good, like something good came out of this situation, but it was another psychologist and a book writer who worked for NASA herself that said that what Lisa was saying was actually completely true. In terms of other astronauts thinking that speaking about their mental health issues is going to jeopardize their career, their flight status, that they will never ever be sent to space, which is like the ultimate dream of this career. So now every year when they have the physical test, which is funny how you think that every year we should test them out physically, like are they physically capable? But we didn't think of introducing behavioral analysis up until this happened. It always takes the worst kind of event and like the worst side of humanity to show for changes to be made. Why? So that's the story on Lisa Nolak. We finally come to the questions. The questions I have, first of all, do you think that she would have killed Colleen? Personally, I think so, because she was armed. She committed to this journey, she committed to driving for this long, to wearing a diaper not to stop anywhere in order to make it there in time, to find her when she was isolated in a place that she probably didn't know the outline of, where she was most vulnerable. I definitely think this could have ended a lot worse. Let me know what you think on that one. The second one is what motivated this escalation? As I mentioned, there were quite a few triggers, just like in days, months, and that past year prior to this. Now let me mention one thing that I haven't yet, because I find it fascinating, and that is that this motive might have had to do with her trip to the space. And that is really what the directors and producers of the movie honed on when describing and identifying Lucy and why she did it in a movie. And it's very obvious even from the trailer if you haven't seen the movie yet. Have you ever heard about the overview effect? It's the quickest way is, well, to watch the trailer, to picture it, or just to picture any entry scene to, like, any documentary or anything where they show you, like, a bird's eye of a place and then they kind of, like, zoom it in onto a particular street, particular people. So this is the event that is usually mentioned in a positive connotation, where astronauts would go to space and then how they perceive it from there, how there's just borderless Earth and how small it looks from the space. There's actually the author of the book that coined the term in a way, and let me just read you out how he perceives it himself. So this is from Frank White, who popularized the term in his book The Overview Effect, Space Exploration and Human Evolution. The Earth doesn't fill your field of vision, but you can see in astonishing detail. Below you, nature, wind, erosion, forests, mountains, displays utter disregard for borders. Devoid of political fictions, the land itself renders conflict over it ridiculous. It's not that the world is big, it's that within the context of space, it's mind-bogglingly small. The idea is, because she spent two weeks there, that once she returned, she could never go back into the mindset, she could never go back into her old self, because everything just looked out of place, she felt out of place, everything just felt so small and meaningless. Which would then, on top of everything else that was happening in her life with her affair and then, like, her broken marriage that eventually resulted in divorce, would make it so much more difficult for her to readjust. So that's an idea. Then another idea that also kind of shows up in a movie, and a lot of you will probably think that this might have motivated her, that she just wanted to eliminate the threat out of the way for her to end up with Offline. I don't know if she was rational enough to realize that that's not how life works based on her diagnosis at trial. I am not sure that she was doing all of this up until that point just for a man. And that's another thing that these directors and producers try to demonstrate, that this was more of a third thing, which is an identity crisis. So it's more of everything that was going on through her life, everything piled up and then just imploded in that one instance. Why I'm personally leaning more towards the identity crisis 
is because of what happened after it. Like, I do think she just exploded. I definitely think it would have ended up in murder had Colleen not reacted that way. Don't get me wrong on that. But after she had her cool-off period, she had a trial, she had to actually stay at home while doing community service and just being out on probation, she could have still ended up stalking both of them. She could have turned into one of those cases of stalkers where they will not stop until they have it their way, until they eliminate whoever they consider to be a threat. That's why, personally, I think it's more of an identity crisis of everything that was piling up in terms of her work and her personal life and then just merged and she, one day, just didn't see any other solution but to enter his flat, then got enraged after seeing the email exchange that was sexual between the two of them, and then just realized that that was her point of no return. She needs to do something about it. But that's it. I think I left you with like 10 questions <laughs> like that I don't really have the answers to. I just don't like to leave a video on a this is all done for a man kind of note because I just highly doubt that it was just done because of a man. I, I'd like to believe personally, deep down here, that it's not. Like, he doesn't... Okay, John Hamm in a movie? Would you kill for him? Okay, <laughs> wrong question. <laughs> wrong question. If he... Had he actually looked like John Hamm, would I understand it? Still not. Still not. Still would not. But, you know, it would be a bit more comprehensible. Understandable and comprehensible is still the same word, my. The point I'm trying to drive at desperately and unsuccessfully is that I think it was a mixture of her personal and professional life that made her just lose it one day. And yes, maybe you were leaning more towards, no, this was definitely done for a guy so that she would end up with him. But if she had a rational bone in her mind, that's not an expression, if she was rational to any certain degree, she would know that he would just end up finding somebody else, the way he did with his ex-wife, the way that he has done with her. And also, we can't neglect that we have a very unique situation here, where this woman did go to space. Even just the experience in itself, if you don't believe in the observer effect or anything like that, would probably change you and how you think once you return to the Earth. I just don't think that there were enough studies done in that particular area for us to completely just eliminate it and be like, well, this doesn't have anything to do with this case or this crime. And well, the fact that they didn't have this annual testing procedure also doesn't really help their case for us to be like, oh no, we have something that we can refer to as admin and then we can see how her behavior processed for years and maybe pinpoint the other events that took place during those years for us to say why she actually did it. So yet again, this is the end of the case of Lisa Nowak. Do you know the answers to any of my questions? If you do, let me know. And until you get your next fix of me, which is probably coming this Friday in the form of Last Meals video, try spotting that colleague of yours or a friend of yours that just has a bit too much on their plate. And just even telling them that they do might help. If not, like, offering to, like, offload something off their plate or, you know, just outlining that maybe they need some professional help and ask them if their company treats mental health seriously and if not, why not? Maybe they should pioneer in that. And in doing so, keep making this world a bit, tiny bit, tiny bit of a better place. Until we all can go to space and then have the observer effect and just look at you and be like, oh, this looks dumb. I don't want nothing to do with this. And then come back and destroy the world as we know it. Bye, guys. Yeah, just, just leave with no explanation. No explanation. Zero. What was that? It's like the beginning of an apocalyptic movie. And I just left like, oh yeah, that's my fault. And that was that. We shot that shit. We put that in the bin. Anything. This is gonna be fun. Today I'm bringing you a story about an astronaut. My, I swear to God. Astronaut. Astronaut.
<laughs> you never pronounced the word before. You could do it. You could do it. Take 20. I don't even know the book. Today I'm bringing you... <laughs> Stop it, it is. Just, what, what's, what's the synonym? Google. <laughs> Please give me the synonym. I actually can't do it. <laughs> I read a thing about the wrong name in bed in only one source. You bet I think it's correct. You bet. <laughs> you bet your ass. Like the awkwardness of it is just correct. It's just like the spur of the moment, yeah? It's like the name is Colleen Lisa. Lisa. So, what can we conclude from that? Lisa was good in bed. Yeah. Mark my words. <laughs> this is what back home you used to like cover up the, I don't know, gardening. So cover up, you know, the dead things that comes out of your garden. It's not something you actually intentionally grow. It's a violet. Red flags, red flags all around. <laughs> it's like the biggest red flag came with this South African violet shit. Of course, this verdict also came with the uh, Cease to exist. What is it? I call it that. No. Restraining word. Okay. No. Another take. Do it. Call it Lisa. He has been faithful to you, girl. Don't... I have no doubt about it. I have no... 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 No, no doubt. I <laughs> didn't come in for shit. Colleen? Listen to me. He's old now. He ain't going nowhere, Colleen. I, I'm not gonna speculate on this. No. Cheaters can change. 